Hello, my name is Josh Sanders and I am a junior in the surveying engineering program at Ferris State University in Big Rapids, Michigan. And today I will be presenting a presentation that I made and gave at the Michigan Society of Professional Surveyors Conference last week in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So if you were unable to attend uh, or missed a portion of that presentation, hopefully this will serve as adequate. So the title slide here, we have some of the members of Burt and Mullet, which is a student surveying RSO here on campus. And it is also a student chapter of the National Society of Professional Surveyors. And these nice coats you see us wearing uh, were generously donated by Siler Geospatial. So uh, big thanks to them for those. They look great and really come in handy when it gets cold outside for our labs. So a quick overview of the categories I will be talking about in this presentation. First off, we have the Dragon Trail, and then I will talk about campus control, and finally, uh, the Vild T4 Theodolite. So first off, the Dragon Trail. Uh, this is a mountain bike trail not far from campus that is still under construction, but is around three quarters or more complete. So Ferris State has helped with senior capstone projects on this trail ranging from uh, property boundaries to as-built of the trail uh, and also uh, GIS deliverables. Uh, so I will be talking more about the as-built GIS um, side of things. Here is a current map of the Dragon Trail. Uh, the portions that I mapped were part of segment three and then segment four. And I worked from the south to the north. And this trail really is beautiful. It's amazing how close it is to campus. And uh, it was really an ideal work site for me. So. Here are the main tools I used for this project. The Trimble GIS GPS receiver backpack along with the R12i rover you can see up on top there. For the accuracies required for this project, uh, these tools worked great. It was really nice not having to carry a rod the whole way. And uh, for how long of a mapping project this was, I really think this was uh, one of the more ideal setups considering we couldn't drive an ATV or snowmobile along this trail. And there was a few inches of snow on the ground when I was out there. The temperature was great, but this also meant the snow was melting and my feet got soaked. But um, I made it through and uh, as you can see from that picture on the left, it was beautiful out. So here is the existing data and it was collected, like I said, in previous capstone projects. They did it during some warmer months of the year. So they used the same backpack unit, but they rode a bike instead of hiking like I did. Again, just with the time crunch, I was uh, not able to bike it, but it's totally okay. And they were collecting bridges, lookouts, signs, uh, taking pictures of these items and uh, making a GIS map out of it. So for the new data, I kind of did my own thing. Uh, so I used continuous topo on eight foot intervals. I used M dot cores and I hiked it. So here are some more pictures. I, you can see I was using the TSC five collector which did get a little annoying to carry at times, but it also made it convenient to uh, make sure I had radio. And when I came across items like signs, it was easy to um, take shots on those. Here is one of the bridges. So it's a pretty good sized bridge and we just want to make sure that in our data we have these located so um, they can easily find these and 
it's, it's just helpful to know good locations uh, of these um, pretty good size infrastructure items. Uh, throughout the trail, they have pretty good signage. Uh, they mark the, the county lines with these signs. And uh, so this is entering Macosta County. It, the trail kind of weaves between uh, Macosta County and Nuego County in this section. So uh, I went back and checked how close these land to the county lines and they're right on. So I'm not sure who set these, but they did a good job. So this is data from my watch, which I recorded for the hike. It ended up being about 7.8 miles of walking, but not all of this was on the trail as I parked a little ways off and hiked in. So uh, all in all, it was closer to six and a half miles of mapping I did. And you can see I was going about two miles an hour, and this is a bit slower than my normal hiking speed, but when I was finding myself under evergreens or really uh, thick foliage, I was losing radio. So that is what slowed me down as I had to wait um, here and there. So here we have the data I recorded with the R12i and my watch data. Um, and as you can see, the R12i is a lot smoother. The, the watch data uh, gets pretty sporadic. And I had some people ask why go out there with uh, such a capable instrument uh, like the R12i when they're just going to turn this into a big map where some of these things would disappear uh, as far as the inconsistencies in the watch data. And... Uh, my answer to that is just looking at this data, it is so much smoother and so much more accurate. And uh, if people ever did need to uh, zoom in to figure out more details about this data, um, this is really where it makes the difference. So again, the blue line and dots are the data I collected with the R12i and the red line is from my watch. Uh, here's another example where the watch lines get off, and uh, I do want to give credit where it's due. This is a Garmin Instinct I'm wearing, which uh, by no means is meant to be a high-precision GPS collection watch, but um, I just wanted to, again, have something to compare um, with the data I was collecting. So in ArcGIS Pro Geoprocessing, I was able to take all the individual points I collected with the continuous topo and use the points to line function. And I ended up doing um, individual lines between each point rather than the continuous line that is shown in this screenshot. And that just made it so when I had data from the other side of the um, Hardy Pond that wasn't meant to be connected, this would make it so um, I could easily delete lines crossing the pond that weren't meant to be there. So uh, this made it really smooth um, to connect all these points by line. Um, so that pretty much covers the um, Dragon Trail project. Um, again, I was only out there for one day and there is more trail to be mapped. So hopefully we will be getting back out there and ultimately um, we can deliver a, a shapefile in GIS to the um, trail people, the ones who are um, building it and um, the people who are using it. So on to campus control, the Ferris Geodetic Reference Network. So we have a variety of different types of monuments on campus. I have a few of them here. And for this project, I didn't really know what existed. We have a few different lists floating around of different control networks on campus. And 
uh, some from MDOT, and not everything is on um, the NGS map. So um, that made it so I just wanted an updated list of everything we had. And I know that used to be a typical thing that was done most years, but as of most recently, to my best knowledge, it hasn't been done where all these points were checked. So I went out, um, tried to take good pictures of everything, and yeah, I'll get right into it. So here's an earlier picture, I think from the early 2000s of when uh, this network was for the most part monumented. So not all these points exist, but I just thought this was a good graphic showing all the names and connections between these points. So while I was planning for this project, I wanted to make the field work as seamless and efficient as possible. So I took all these different coordinate sets I had from a variety of sources and uh, put them into a CSV and then uploaded them to ArcGIS field maps. And this made it so on my phone I could plan good routes between points and also just get uh, a good lay for the land as um, the previous sources I had access to, it was tough to decipher kind of where some of these points were. So once I got in the general area, I staked out um, to them with my R12i and uh, I've used field maps in my previous jobs and I think it really comes in handy for the uh, for planning and just saving time as a whole. So here are some examples of the different monuments around campus and then the number of monuments I found of those types. So the standard disc, uh, those were mostly monumented in a senior capstone a few years ago, and none of these are in NGS, which I thought was interesting because these are some really nice, good-sized monuments, and they're in really good locations. Um, next, we have just a regular old M dot point, and then the most prevalent of all the monuments are these one-inch brass caps with different names on them. I found 22 of those. We have one of these vertical control marks. Um, this is on the side of the post office. So if you went to Ferris, you may have had some level loops where you uh, um, ran them down to the post office and back. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only vertical control mark we have. Um, on campus where it's actually on the side of a building rather than just vertical control on the ground. And then on the right here, we have three height modernization disks from MDOT. I think these were set around 2007 or 2008. Um, yeah, I believe that's right. So like I said, only some of these points are on NGS and the coordinates came from a variety of different documents in the equipment room. So here are the results. Pretty self-explanatory, but the, the green pinpoints are monuments that were found and all of these red pinpoints are monuments that have been obliterated. And none of these were obliterated on purpose. Uh, they were all just in the line of construction. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in, on campus in the last 20 years since these were monumented. And so of the 59 locations searched, I found 32 of them, which is pretty close to what I was expecting. And there was one mystery monument I found that was not on any lists. Uh, it was, I have a slide coming up on it, but again, it just happened to be another, uh, by another point I was looking at and I was, I was pretty surprised to come across it. So here's the NGS web map, just some statistics on that. There are 31 monuments listed of ours on, on the map viewer that have been cataloged. 21 of those were located. So 10 of these you see on that map have been obliterated. So we'll have to go in and 
make some updates to those data sheets. 29 of the points I looked at were not on NGS and only 11 of those were located. So a lot more of those have been ripped out, which I'm assuming is why they're not on NGS anymore, if they, if they were at all. And I know the 31 and 29 don't add up to 59, but um, there was a point further off campus that I ended up removing from my results just because it, it wasn't as pertinent. It was a good ways away. So here's the mystery point. It's named Laner. It looks just like all of our other one inch brass caps. You can see in that picture on the right, it is right next to the science building. In that middle picture, you can kind of see the observatory on top of the science building. If you know anything about this point, uh, when it was set, um, I've heard the Laner name before. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, but uh, I, I found it pretty interesting that it wasn't recorded on any of these other resources I had. Just for fun, I threw in some pictures of the what I believe were some of the original monumentation teams. And I believe it was 2001 that these pictures were taken. So there might be some familiar faces in there. Some others. So future plans, I'd really like to perform some uh, fast static observations on these points and just get some more up-to-date data. Also, I would like to run these points through Opus eventually, do another level loop. I don't think a lot of these have changed too much, but again, we're just trying to get um, consistent data for all of them. I'd like to make a better GIS map. What I currently have in field maps was helpful for me with this project, but ultimately I'd like something that students can use for their labs and um, easily maneuver with that um, has the pictures embedded as far as locating these points, especially in winter. It can really help to have those, um, those pictures if you're unable for some reason to just stake out to the point. I'd like to add some new monuments. A lot of these were dedicated to program supporters or companies in the area or professors. And there are a lot of people I think who deserve to have their name kind of embedded in Ferris history. So eventually I would like to monument some new points and then also re-monument some of the obliterated points as we don't want to forget some of these names that um, were once on these monuments and also making a new physical map, which will probably tie right in with the GIS map I just talked about. This is one on the right is one of the main ones that we have right now. And I know at the conference, someone shared the name of who made that great map. I'd just like to update a little bit again with what is actually there and, um, add some pinpoints hopefully. So, uh, again, it's just easy to tell where everything is. And that concludes campus control. So now on to the Vild T4 Theodolite. This thing is massive. You can see that measuring tape in the bottom right there for scale. And this is about as serious as you get when it comes to theodolites. This picture on the right, I took from an auction site just because it shows the cases in storage, those wooden boxes on the top hold the hanging level. The box on the right holds the telescope assembly, which separates from the base. And then that biggest box on the left holds um, the base of the instrument. So this picture is from Ferris. Uh, you can probably recognize some of these faces. On the left, we have uh, Jens Otto Rick, who was a uh, pretty legendary photogrammetry professor at Ferris. Uh, I've never met him, but heard lots of good stories. So the T4 theodolite was mainly utilized from the 1940s to the 1970s. There were 439 produced 
and uh, they are used to establish astronomical latitude and longitude through star observations. So the instrument that Ferris has was produced in 1956. Ferris acquired it roughly in 1976 from NOAA and Professor Birch used this instrument in his capstone. And it is my understanding that Ferris acquired it um, partially for Professor Birch to be able to do his capstone. And I can't remember his partner's name for that. So I apologize. So on our instrument, the horrible, hopefully I'm saying that right, level and the suspension level are cracked. So uh, there are quite a few levels and unfortunately those um, have been cracked for as long as I've um, seen the instrument and replacements go for $750. So I don't think we'll be replacing this anytime soon just because it's not really being used for labs, but uh, we'll see. Uh, some people have offered up that money, so it would be cool to get this in working order again. And tripods weren't typically used with this instrument just because it is so heavy and so sensitive. So here we have an astro pillar that was on the Cat Key Golf Course. I still haven't made it over there to see if it's still there, but I know trees have grown up where it was, and I have been told by a few people that it was removed. So but I still want to go see the location for myself, hopefully this week. So those are both pictures from Ferris. This also demonstrates the broken telescope. So you can see he's looking in from the side there and it is an inverted image, which we'll see in some of the coming slides. Here's another picture up at Cat Key. Like I said, tripods are rare. I kind of jumped ahead on this one, I guess. Uh, in the 60s, they used the Vild BC-4. The base is similar to the T-4, but instead of a telescope, an aerial camera was used for satellite triangulation. So I've never seen one of these in person, but um, they outlived the T-4s by a little bit, by my understanding. This photo is from the NOAA photo library, and it's just an example again of the um, one of the tripod options that were sometimes used. This picture was taken about in 1970 with the Coast and Geodetic Survey. And you can see here why they used a broken telescope, because uh, when you were sighting in stars, there's no way uh, you could have looked through the um, back of that telescope as it's obstructed by the base. So, yep. So here's our instrument. Uh, here I am with Taylor Van Dyke. Uh, this thing's been sitting in the equipment room for quite a while. I'm not sure the last time it saw the uh, outside fresh air. So we decided with the broken levels, uh, we wanted to try to do a simple um, bit of triangulation. We know it's it's really more so meant for astronomical um, readings, but uh, we just wanted to turn an angle. You know, the the shortest distance this thing can sight is 150 meters, from what I've been told. So uh, we set some points. One was 350 feet out. One was 450 feet out. And since we don't have that astro pillar anymore, uh, we set up on the stage out in front of the university center. And man, it's just cool seeing the size of this thing in comparison to us. It, it weighs 110 pounds. At this point, we, we just carried it out there box by box and it was hard work, but we did end up buying a wagon. So now we can pull it around a little easier. So here we have Taylor uh, looking through the, the site. So here we have some pictures of the scales. I know the lines aren't exactly lined up here, but uh, this shows the degrees, minutes, and seconds. And that bottom scale you can see, you can read down to a tenth of a second directly, which is pretty crazy to me. And 
here we have the what the inverted image looked like uh, looking at our targets now there's a lot of knobs and possible adjustments on this thing and it was kind of a spur of the moment project to take this thing outside so we couldn't quite figure out how to get the parallax right which is why you can see the crosshairs in one picture and not the other but we did buy the manual for this instrument online so hopefully we can really dive into how to properly adjust the parallax so i'm not going to try to pronounce this name but um, this guy has been super helpful he's the one who sold us the manual and he actually was pretty interested in our t4 as he knows very well that not many were made and a lot of them are either no longer in existence or um, just not in easy view of the public like ours is. But he went through documents at the factory. I'm not sure what his actual position is, but um, he went through these documents from 1956 and found uh, the two circle protocols. There was about 18 pages of um, handwritten numbers when they were doing the uh, quality control, I believe, on this instrument. So that was pretty cool to see. Here's another picture he sent, uh, the horizontal circle, which is made out of glass, and the vial the, uh, from the hanging vial of the T4, which, again, is one of the levels that is broken on our instrument. And uh, those go for 750 bucks. So maybe one day. So that pretty much ties up the T4. Uh, that angle we turned, compared it to uh, GPS shots I took on those points, and it was within three tenths of a second to those GPS readings, which honestly I trust the, the T4 a lot more than I do um, those observations I took with the, the R12i, but it was cool to see um, that we can still turn angles with it. And, um, yeah, I really hope to do a lot more with this and we would like to get a display case built for it too. We have a lot of other older instruments on display and this thing would really, um, be the crown jewel in that, uh, room, I think. So that is in progress. So I know I said I had three categories, but real quick, I want to go through kind of a bonus category. I work in the survey equipment room as the equipment room attendant at Ferris and I've come across a lot of old photos and I've been working on digitizing them and trying to find out more about them just because um, for any of you who know anything about the Ferris survey program has a lot of rich history and I'd really like to preserve this and uh, share it with alumni so Anyways, we have a group of guys at Abrams Aerial Survey down there on the left. I'm not sure who's in that photo on the right. Um, I think the, the professor on the left there of that right photo is either David Henry. Yeah, I, be I believe it is David Henry. And I've been told that um, he laid out a good portion of US-131. So correct me if I'm wrong on that. Here we have some of the first survey class in the, the old barracks at campus, which no longer exist. But uh, you can see some of the names written on there. Jim Sandberg. Uh, Bill Johnson, Wayne Lesher, who is one of the original professors. So I think that's a pretty cool photo. And uh, here we have some of the um, original students again and Wayne Lesher. Photogrammetry instruments I have a love for. I don't really know how to operate them that well. I've only oriented a stereo plotter once and not sure who these guys are, but yeah. Here we've got some more stereo plotters. Uh, 
Um, here's a history board I threw together in the hallway at Ferris. If you're ever um, around campus and want to walk through second floor of Swan, you can check these out. And again, I hope to get all these pictures online soon, but um, just trying to show the students again what um, some of the cool historical parts of this program. Uh, here's another wall I put together, and this is some of the photos from internships of our students this summer. So uh, lots of helicopter pictures and snow from Alaska and original bearing trees and just all sorts of cool things. And here's a website I've been putting together. It's still under construction, but hopefully this is where I'll get all those pictures uploaded. And um, yeah, so with that being said, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments or um, send me an email. And uh, especially if you have any pictures or documents that um, you don't think I already have, I, I'd love to get my hands on them so I can, uh, again, uh, publish them on this, this platform. So uh, thanks very much.